This is For The Creators. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of For The Creators. Apologies for the long pause between uh, the last episode and this episode. Um, there was a lot of travelling between Veneer and myself and we've been hard at work, working on new episodes too, of which we have the new one coming up today. Today we sit down with Sahil Lavinga, who is the founder of Gumroad. And put simply, Gumroad helps creators sell their music, comics, software, books and films, ebooks, everything in between. They've sent over $199 million to artists, designers, educators, writers, influencers and more. Um, it's a really, really cool platform, which really, really speaks to our audience of creators all over the world. So sat down with Sahil to speak about how Gumroad came about, his journey from Singapore to uh, the US of A, how he built apps every weekend and how Gumroad came out of that. Being an early employee at Pinterest, his favorite stories from Gumroad, raising money and all the ups and downs that come with that. This is a really cool episode. Definitely take out your notepad or open your notes app, jot down some bullet points. Uh, there's a lot of actionables from this episode. Also in the show notes, there is an invite to Gumroad. If you click that link, um, that will get you set up on there so you can start selling directly to your audience. Really hope you enjoy this episode. Remember to give us a review on Apple Podcasts or more importantly, share it with another creator or someone who you think would like this. Really appreciate that. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Sahil Lavinga. Okay, Sahil, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So first off, um, can you explain what Gumroad is for our listeners? And then we'll dive into a bit about your story. Totally. So Gumroad is... Uh, a piece of software that we built to help creators make money on the internet. Um, so basically, um, super simple e-commerce software for creators. We help musicians, designers, writers, filmmakers, basically any anyone uh, that makes stuff. We want to make it really easy for them to sell that stuff directly to their audience. Um, so that's the sort of the pitch. Okay. Amazing. So, just going back on your story uh what was it like growing up in singapore yeah it was cool i mean it's, it was different i mean i don't really have a ton of context for like how growing up not in singapore is <laughs> true <laughs> but but it was cool i think it was like this interesting um middle ground of uh like western culture and sort of eastern culture if that makes sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um it definitely feels i mean you know there's bubbles within singapore um so it sort of depends but for me um it felt like i was sort of always visiting like i never felt super integrated into the communities for better or worse right. um so it kind of made me grow up with this sort of like outsider mentality a little bit mm. that i kind of like so you were saying you were saying um, uh, that you did, there was no real point of reference for, for not growing up in Yeah, Singapore. and I think Singapore is this interesting place where it's very sort of Western. Um, so Singapore itself feels like a little bit of a weird place within Southeast Asia. Right. And then within Singapore, there are these like communities that feel weird within Singapore. Um And so, but I think in general, it just gives you this mentality of like being a little bit of an outsider and not really sort of fitting in, um, but then also realizing that, like, I think, you know, Singapore is a super young country, mm -hmm. um, so everyone is still sort of figuring it out, right? and seeing that on, like, a sort of, like, a city, country level scale, I think it just, like, sh gives you a little bit more ambition, mm -hmm. because you feel like you can contribute a little bit more to it, there's not as much sort of set in stone already. Right, that makes sense. So what was the transition like for you when you returned to the U.S. at 18? It was weird. Everyone was a lot taller. That was like the <laughs> first thing that I noticed. It was like everyone had a gun and everyone was taller. Yeah, that's a bit of a um, difference. It's a bit weird. But um, no, it was good. I mean, I think 
I had this expectation that I would like come to California and like immediately be part of this tech community and tech scene mm. and startups and all of that. And that didn't really happen. I think one of the things like I kind of pictured America as this monolith, uh, maybe how some people might look at any, you know, any place they're not sort of super familiar with. And so I thought, you know, America's like this American dream and technology yeah. and startups and, you know, Silicon Valley and all sorts of stuff. But really, uh, the serendipity of it doesn't really happen like automatically. It doesn't, you know, you don't, it's not like you just get off the plane in Los Angeles and you're immediately connected, you know? Yeah, exactly. Probably not dissimilar from creative industries like publishing or music or film or anything. Right. It takes work. You know, there are a lot of people that are trying to get into it. So it's not, it's not necessarily like just showing up is going to get you, you know, invited to the party. Mm. Definitely. So at this point, so you're, you're, deciding uh to be an entrepreneur um but you were always a, a creative right yeah i mean i started out designing and then i learned to code and then i decided i would you know when you're when you're able to design and code it sort of gives you this unique ability to basically build anything you want mm. and to a pretty high level of proficiency and so very you know it's hard to to have those skills and not think about starting a company because it seems like the best, one of the better ways at least to utilize it. Because, you know, even if you work at a company, it's pretty difficult to, to be a generalist, yes. to design and code on a, on a sort of a daily basis. Yep. You're sort of inevitably going to be forced um, into a single path. I mean, frankly, even if you start the company, you're going to be forced probably, but um but definitely in the early days, yeah, if you want to design and code, I think, and be sort of rewarded for it, have an equity compensation that you think, it, that I believe is fair for it, you kind of have to start a company. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's ultimately what led you down that road. Yeah. That makes sense. So you've landed in California. Um, how did you end up spending a semester at USC and then becoming the second hire at Pinterest? I mean, definitely not to my credit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a it's a cool story, but really, Ben sent me an email to see of interest, mm -hmm. um, and he said, "Yeah, you know, like I saw your work online. I posted some of the things that I had built on a forum, a web forum called Hacker News, and which is sort of frequented by most Silicon Valley people. Yeah, uh, and definitely sort of founders, investors, etc." And the eyeballs that you typically are going to want on your stuff. Mm. And, um, yeah, I just got an email out of the blue from him and, you know, he told me about Pinterest. Uh, you know, he told me it was a piece of software that allowed people to, you know, collect, share, organize the things that they love, things that they're into. And they needed an iPhone app. That was sort of what I was focused on at the time was designing and developing iPhone apps for myself. Okay. And it was, yeah, it was just a great opportunity. I could, you know, basically... Because it was the iPhone app, it was sort of separate from the website, so I could do it remotely and right. sort of own it, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it was just me. I was the product manager. I was the designer. I was the engineer on it. And uh, and that's what they wanted, too, you know, because they're busy <laughs> doing whatever they are doing. They would love not to worry about something else, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So, so yeah, that's how it happened. He just sent me an email. I drove up to Berkeley for a USC Cal game, I think, uh, that I didn't even attend, but I used it as an excuse to go up to Berkeley, met up with them in person <laughs> for a few hours at a coffee shop. And yeah, we just, I had, at that point, I think I had started getting offers from other companies to join full time right. while my interest gig was just contract. And so, yeah, they just said, you know, yeah, if you're interested, if you, if this is a thing you're going to do, like you're going to leave school and join a startup, yeah, we'd love to be considered as one of them, you know. And so they made me an offer, and I ended up, yeah, taking a leave of absence, dropping out, whatever you call it, from USC, and then joining uh, Pinterest full-time in January 2011. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I really, when I went to school, I did not intend to spend four months there. Yeah. Um, some people think, like, oh, he must have, like, had this plan, you know, uh, no, I did not. Like you I said, wish it, I was that smart. Yeah. Well, you put your work out there and things start to happen. 
Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's funny because the path's not that different to uh, what I recommend creators do. Mm. You know, you look at a lot of these stories of famous or successful musicians or writers or filmmakers or startup founders or what have you, and like there are a few mo- there are moments in these people's lives that just happened, <laughs> and yeah. you know, it's difficult to read about them and apply them because it's not necessarily applicable to you and you can't just say oh yeah like put your work out there and bend from pictures you know someone will reach out to you and you'll get a job as a second employee at a 10 billion dollar company um but you do need to put yourself out there because you never know like what you know what's what's happening around you and what other people are thinking about and in search of and if you don't put yourself out there, like it's definitely not going to happen, right? So mm. you might as you might as well. I completely agree with that. Completely, completely agree. Um, why do you think 2010 was such a important year for tech? Yeah, I think I, I assume it must have been it must have had something to do with the App Store, mm. the iPhone App Store really picking up. Um, I know the iPhone came out in 2007, so, you know, two, three years later. Um, my guess is that it had just reached a certain saturation in the market in yeah. which you just had, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people using this new thing mm-hmm. and, like, being connected to the internet in, like, like, a very, very different way. And I think that's why from sort of 2008 to 2010 you see a lot of companies, I mean, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, you know, like there's a, there's a much longer list, I'm sure, yeah. of, of sort of consumer, especially consumer-oriented companies. Mm. Um, I think probably the uh, cameras on phones probably got up to a level in which people felt comfortable taking photos and they looked sort of good enough to share. Yeah. Um, and then I think probably just like the dominance of Facebook. I think Facebook... Um, just got everyone talking to each other on the internet and made things like uh, like uh, trust and sort of uh, what do they call it? trust and safety um, things like that. People just mm-hmm. got more comfortable like talking to people on the internet, following people on the internet, really caring about anyone on the internet. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Beyond celebrities, right? People had America has like this sort of relationship with with celebrities, and that's been there for you know since Hollywood, right? I mean, yeah, a long time. But I think what the internet did was allow for this, like, sort of much broader definition of that. And, like, it, you could might call it an influencer or what have you, but sort of anyone can now sort of have this relationship with an audience, um, this sort of, like, information asymmetric relationship with their audience. Yeah. Which I think is what really drove... Um, and continues to drive like the sort of the patterns that we see and what led to, yeah, this sort of crazy success of YouTube and Pinterest and everything like that. Crazy. Crazy. So you used to build an app every weekend. What was it about? Gum- tried. <laughs> what was it about Gumroad that stood out for you? Yeah. I mean, so there are a few things. I mean, I think there's a sort of the, on the tactical level, I wanted to work on something that had money involved. Mm-hmm. I felt like there were so many apps that didn't really have a clear path to monetization, or at least one that I was interested in. Um, like advertising is sort of the standard, the default. Um, I didn't really want to get into that. Um, even at Pinterest, I suggested some paid options, but sort of never gained traction internally. Um, so that was a thing, right? I was mm-hmm. always I, I, not not to say I would I refuse to build anything that didn't fit that, but if I was going to pick one thing and spend five years sort of dedicated to it on sort of a singular level, I wanted it. I wanted sort of some payments, transaction, something to do with with money. I felt like it was the easiest way to monetize that felt pure and true to the service. Right, that makes um, sense. I also wanted to work on something that had growth built into it that like if the product was good it would sort of grow organically you know with Gumroad you to sell a product you have to share it with your audience and so there's this inherent viral loop um, 
that was built into it. And that's mostly because I think building a great product is hard enough. Like building a great product and also having to grow it is really basically a miracle when it happens. Mm. And so I really wanted something that just I could focus on building a great product and the, and the growth would sort of take care of itself to a degree. Um, and then I think the last thing, and this is the sort of the less tactical, but like I said, I think in hindsight, uh, it was just like an emotional thing is I just really loved working on a product that would empower creators. Yeah. I just felt like there was just so much creative potential and the internet, like just like what we talked about more and more of these people had audiences people were paying attention to all of these creative people, mm-hmm. but there wasn't like a really easy way for any of these people to monetize. They were still basically just monetizing via YouTube partnership ads or um, brand sponsorships or whatever. Like these sort of like pretty traditional old school ways that don't really work at a lower level. Yeah, You know, you kind of have to reach a certain scale, like a million people or whatever to, to get to a point uh, in which like you can really monetize in like a, in a more direct way, like selling your own stuff. Yeah. Um, and so when we started to see that shift, yeah, I just got excited about like what happens, like what happens if we make it super easy to sell? Mm. Um, it was sort of the what if I think that, that, um, made it interesting to me. Um, kind of like, you know, when you read a great book, it's to me like a great book is, is sort of, it's like a thought experiment, right? You're like, if this world has no water on it or something, like how would we, evolve yeah uh, or whatever um and and sort of explore the implications of that and i think starting as a company was similar to me it was like what happens if it was basically the easiest thing in the world to sell something it was no more difficult to sell something as it is today to share something like what would happen mm-hmm. and i just sort of got obsessed i think with that at those the ripple effects of that the layers of change and I just couldn't get it out of my head, so I was like, "Okay, I guess I'm, this is what I'm working on. I might as well get, you know, raise money and get paid for it." Absolutely. So, two years after starting at Pinterest, you managed to raise eight million dollars for Gumroad. Um, yeah. How, how did you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, definitely being part of Pinterest helped. I think it gave me credibility. It made me. It it sort of gave a hook to people to investors because, you know, this kid leaving sort of a rocket ship like Pinterest, like there must be something there. Right. He's either crazy in a good way or, or crazy in a bad way. And, um, um, so I think that was the number one most important thing was I was sort of an established player in the Valley, you know, Mm. because I had worked at a company and people could do reference checks on me. Um, and then I think the other thing was just, I could design and code and I was like, you know, pretty sociable person, pretty personable person. And so, that's what, sort of I, I fit the pattern, I guess, that VCs are looking for. And it doesn't take a lot. Mm. Um, you can go from knowing zero investors to one investor it might take you a year. But to go from one investor to 100 takes you know a few weeks. Wow. Because all you Work need is right. one legitimate person within a community to say, hey, <laughs> I vouch for this person. Right? Like, I want this person to get funded. I'm putting in some money. Yeah. Um, you know, meet this person. Uh, that's like the most amazing part to me about San Francisco and Silicon Valley is there's this huge incentive to, I, I call it sort of the transitive property of trust, but basically anyone will meet anybody based on an intro mm-hmm. because it's in sort of everyone's long-term best interest to be connected, to pay attention, to be helpful. And, you know, cause you never know who's going to be the next, you know, Bill Gates or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, there's this huge incentive to, to, to I mean, I, w- I met almost like every investor in Silicon Valley in like three months. Wow. Because two people vouched for me and, you know, they introduced me to five to ten people. Those people, the ones that liked me, wanted to invest, introduced me to their friends. And, you know, very, very quickly you sort of meet everybody. Wow. It doesn't take a ton of time. I mean, you can do that in a day if you go to, if you, you know, if you're a YC company, you know, yeah. you go to Y Combinator Demo Day, boom, like in a day you meet everybody. Everybody, yeah. yeah. But it really sounds like your, your story and your, um, your like qualities in terms of like design and coding and uh, carrying that what if 
around with you. That's what really, like, the combination of all of that, one, uh, got you into Pinterest. And, yeah. and two, gave you that kind of social capital to then uh, raise money for Gumroad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these things build upon each other, you know. Mm. And so I think there is sometimes sort of a focus on the future and like uh, like sort of where you want to be. Um, and sometimes you just have to be really present and just do like what, you know, like optimize for your sort of present state and your learning and your growth and just sort of hope that those things will come from that. Yeah. And when they do, I think it's like, I think, I think in, in general, I have like a pretty good instinct around being opportunistic and like taking something and turning it into something more. Right. You know, I think, I think I was able to take, to, you know, USC, some of my iPhone apps that I'd made, turn that into Pinterest, turn Pinterest into Gumroad, turn Gumroad into a lot of other stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. And so I think part of it is just not settling and always being a little bit uncomfortable with where you are and being open minded. Mm. Um, maybe I, I do that to a fault potentially, but I think, yeah, I think some people, I don't know. I'm, I'm you know, I, I talk to some folks that are super competent, but they don't really put themselves out there. And I'm not saying you have to, right? Yeah. Everyone can decide to do that on their own, but I think putting yourself out there has some benefits and sort of if you're not doing that, if you're not networking, if you're not playing the game per se, um, if you really believe content is king or like if you make an amazing song, people are just going to find it and listen to it and it's going to blow up. I think that's just a little bit naive because Mm. those aren't, that isn't the way the world works. Um, you need those things to be successful, but you also need other things that don't get talked about or aren't as sort of sexy to mention in the Wikipedia article, right? That's right. Um, like Taylor Swift's dad was like a manager at a label or something like that, right? Like, and that, I'm not saying that to take credit away from her. I'm just saying I'm saying that to give credit to everybody else <laughs> mm, <laughs> that you're point. not being, you know, you're not Taylor Swift. Like for for a variety of reasons, but like you should be aware of some of these that you might not be able to control, and like being able to, you know, I acknowledge that I grew up in Singapore. You know, my parents weren't affluent when they grew up, mm-hmm. you know, in a village in India, but I did grow up pretty affluent, you know, pretty privileged, and like it's okay to talk about those things, and I think it's important to talk about those things because otherwise people might think that the gap is, you know, is is a uh, is like a, a thing that they can fix by reading a book, right? Um, or being active on Twitter, and some of, some of these things will, will take time, mm. yeah, you know, to get to a point. Like my parents did something, so I could do something, right? Um, I wouldn't be here today without them doing what they did, right? Yeah. Crossing an ocean, and uh, so I just think it's important to have the, sort of as much context as possible. Otherwise, I think you know a lot of the creators I talk to are like, "Oh, I'm like working on this thing; it's amazing; it's going to blow up when I release it." And I'm like, "Okay, well." Who have you talk to about sharing it or like which blogs are going to write about it or yeah. whatever. You know? yeah. And, oh, they're like, oh, it's, well, it's just a great song, right? It'll, like word of mouth. And I'm like, yeah, but like where does word of mouth come from? Mm. Right? Like who are the, those first people going to find out about it? It's very rare that some amazing thing just goes viral by itself. Um, it has to be amazing. That's sort of an assumption. But you yeah. also need to like light the fire and like you know, breathe on the fire and like get your friends to do the same thing and your family to do the same thing. You should take advantage of everything that you have instead of just hope that like the thing is going to be good enough. It's a very good point. Very good point. Especially, um, I mean, I'm from the uh, music background and that happens a lot um, <clears throat> in that people, uh, sometimes when a song just comes out of nowhere, you're like, what? They don't really seem to have like a manager or a team or these people behind them. It's not It's not obvious, anyway. Um, and then the song's massive and it's viral. But then when you, like, peel back the layers, you see that there are people like, uh, in certain companies and, you know, like, uh, PRs and things like that that have been yeah. quietly working in the background, you know, so that we all totally. have this music, you know? Totally. I mean, in music specifically, like, the way radio plays work, right? Mm. Like, it's not a super organic thing in publishing the New York Times bestseller list. It's not a super organic thing. Yeah, that's right. And so uh, you don't have to cheat your way to the top necessarily, but knowing about 
the system, you know. It would be like playing basketball without flopping or without trying to draw fouls. Yeah. You can do it. And you can argue that like that's the right way that everyone should play, but the <laughs> rules are the rules. <laughs> yeah, that makes and sense. And people will sort of use the rules to their advantage and if you choose not to, you're welcome to do that, but you're also sort of inherently putting yourself at a disadvantage. Mm. The game is the game. The game, yeah, the game is the game <laughs> and the game is a is a free market. And, you know, like claiming the higher ground in that way um, doesn't really do anything for you, yeah. right? Um, it might do something for you, and you, but you should be strategic about it. You, you, you should think about, okay, what does not playing the game get me? Mm. You know, how can I take advantage of it? If that's your, if that's your, your choice, like then you should, you should still think about your choice strategically. It might just be a different, a different path. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just to dial back on what you were saying before about um, what if uh, you was you were saying, um, you know, as a creator yourself and as um, a tech contrepreneur, do you think those things are mutually exclusive? That you carry that curiosity uh, with you? That oh, what if this? What if I did this? What if I tried this? Um, have you have you seen that? Yeah, I think you train your brain to pick up on stuff like that. Um, regardless of what, uh, industry or what have you, you're in like just training your brain to pick up on problems and solutions and to sort of just like analyze stuff, um, will apply everywhere, right? You can take something you've learned in how music, um, how songs are written or beats are made or what have you and Mm -hmm. sort of apply that to startups and building products and, um, building a company, one hundred percent. I think those those things happen on a, like a very core level, and uh, you know I think um, it doesn't really matter if you're in music or film or in publishing or in startups or tech or whatever. Training your brain to to think of a you know to look at a problem to want to recognize that something is a problem. I think a lot of people just like go around their lives and don't even. I mean, this happens to me sometimes, Mm. Um, whereas I I will, like, live my life, do my thing, right, and and someone will, like, build a company and say, hey, by the way, like, this thing that you used to spend an hour on every day, um, it will automate that for you, and it's, like, two bucks a month or whatever. And I'm like, wow, I never even thought about that part of my life that I was, you know, it's hard uh, to be sort of conscious uh, as you live your life of some of these problems. Mm. Um, so I think training your brain to sort of pick up on those things and then to sort of, yeah, spend an hour like thinking about, okay, what would a different solution look like? Or I prefer sort of just trying to understand why the problem is there in the first place. That's a good train of thought. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So let's talk about Gumroad's early years. So you've, you've raised, um, $8 million. Um, did the focus stay the same in terms of it being a, payments uh, platform for creatives or did did you like experiment with different uh different tools yeah i mean we we have stayed the same roughly i think the the mission and the product are pretty aligned you know we basically want to help creators get paid uh we want to make it easier and easier for creators to make a living to earn a living doing what they love which is making stuff typically not dealing with businessy stuff or e-commerce or what have you yeah um I still think it's early. I, there's a lot, as I talk to creators, there's a lot of stuff that they do. Mm. And it's nice to know because it means that like all of those things, hopefully over time, we can help them do. Right. Um, so I think in that sense, like our, 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 our sort of mission and vision has, has stayed roughly the same. I'd say the way that we've changed is to think about, to define, to sort of broaden, I think, the definition of what a creator is. Yes. Um, I think we started out being very specific about, oh, it's musicians, it's filmmakers. Um, and you know, those are creators too, but I think broadening the net a little bit and saying, well, you know, software engineers that are teaching other people how to learn to code, like those are creators as well. Indeed. Yeah. Um, and then also I think the market is just changing, right? Like the, the creator sort of movement is so new. Um, you know, when Gumroad launched, we tell people, oh yeah, we like help creators sell content. And they're like, what is a creator? 
What does yeah. that even mean? Yeah, like exactly. A, kind of a weird phrase. Whereas now, today, I think it's different. It's a little bit. Most people will be like, "Oh yeah, creators. Yeah, we know." Well, we've so, we've even had that with the with the podcast. Um, oh yeah. For the creators, um, and they're like, "Okay, which ones?" <laughs> so <laughs> that it, it just goes to show how new the the term is in in the mainstream. Although it, yeah. is, it, it is what it says on the can. Like for us, a creator is anyone that creates something out of nothing. You totally. Know? So it seems like you're on a, the the same uh, explanation as well, or definition. Exactly. So did the company grow as fast as you had expected? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a little bit probably too optimistic on most things, which I think is a good attribute if you're building a company, starting a company, and yeah. in general, being more optimistic than less it's good, but it means that you get disappointed a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. But knowing, knowing, it, you know, if you knew about the disappointment beforehand, you might not have started in the first place, right? So I don't regret regret it. But I think, I think in general, there, yeah, it, it grew a lot slower than I was expecting. Um, I think in general, software does. I think it's easy to focus on these crazy sort of success stories or viral things that happen um, and not spend a ton of time focused on the failures of other companies or the slow growth of, of most companies. Yeah. Um, and typically when you hear about something, it's already been a few years, you know, from when they started, right? True. So when you see something blow up, you're sort of already, you know, seeing the, the tail end of a lot of it. Mm. Um, but I think in general, also just specific to Gumroad, you know, we, we focus on creators, right? And in general, it's just a relatively s- still small group of people. There's a lot, um, there's a lot more people, you know, if you look at sort of just the economy, you know, you look at healthcare, you look at housing, you look at food, uh, you look at transportation, um, you look at infrastructure, um, defense, national security, Creators are a tiny, tiny, tiny part of that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you're sort of explicitly deciding to to build for that group of people, it seems big sometimes, but money-wise, it's not. Mm. So that's just sort of something to keep in mind is that, you know, in terms of your average revenue per user, that, you know, average lifetime value of a user, et cetera, like these things um, – are a lot smaller than you might think. Um, and also, I think one, one thing, sort of one learning with Gumroad was that when you look at these creative industries, sometimes they, they seem big, but then when you take the top 10 out of it, yep. you realize how much of a of a big percentage those people are. Yeah. So and true. when you're building a startup, you're not going to capture those people typically, right? You're not going to get Taylor Swift and Harry Potter to, to sell on Gumroad. No. Not yet. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. So, so th- is that why you decided be- to become a bit more lean around 2015? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so we did a big round of layoffs when we went from 20 people to 5 people in 2015. Wow. And that was, yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal, but it was a necessity. You know, it was a thing that we had to do to sort of to control our destiny and make sure that we could be in a place where we were deciding what we wanted to do via profitability versus, you know, hope that we'd be able to raise more money or, or what have you. And so it required a pretty harsh, uh, event, but it was totally worth it because within a year we got from, you know, burning like $300,000 a month to being profitable. Oh, Uh, amazing. And so what that let us do is say, okay, we're stable. We're no longer like treading water in the middle of the ocean, like hoping that someone picks us up or something. Mm. We're now, you know, gonna take our time, figure out what we want to build, who we want to build for, and then build it because we can, because we're profitable and not building it or building something the wrong way or building it too slow or too fast. Right. Isn't going to change that. That's really good. Because so many, so many companies out there are, uh, I mean, the, from what from what we read, like there's so many companies burning cash and just waiting to IPO to then eventually profit. 
Um, but it, it feels like that's changing a bit now where companies are either not going to raise money in the first place um, or to really prioritise uh, controlling the destiny, like you said, and turning a profit so they can um, build the company in the way that they see fit. Yeah, and I think, you know, there are options. And I don't want to recommend never raising money or what have you, but I just think knowing, you know, the different choices that you have when you decide to build a company, um, I think sometimes, because the ones that are venture-backed are typically the ones that become, you know, $10 billion companies, Mm. those are the ones that get all the buzz. That's right, yeah. If you actually look at the amount of companies in the U.S. that get started every year and that are venture funded every year, it's a very, very, very small number of companies ever raise venture, mm. right? And so just being mindful of that and, and sort of saying, yeah, what, what type of company do you want to build? Yes. And then you can decide, you know, the right approach. I think a lot of people just look at... Um, Silicon Valley would say, oh, yeah, I need to raise venture capital. And they don't really think about the different ways you can raise venture capital mm-hmm. or the other options of, of financing a company that have existed for thousands of years, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's other ways. So how did your customers respond to the cuts you made internally? Not well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was one of the harder things was seeing people react like you know we we made this decision because we wanted to preserve the company and a lot of people took it like we were it was like you know uh evidence that we were not gonna sustain you know right and so you know all i could do is say look we're gonna try like i think we have a plan i think you know we made a very dramatic decision because it would save us long-term pain Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a creator, you're getting paid every week on Gumroad, and that's how you pay for your rent and your mortgage, your kids' college funds, your coffee and tea and food and whatever, um, it makes sense that you would be concerned, right, that the service you're using it just laid off a bunch of people. Yeah. So I don't fault anyone for it, mm-hmm. but I definitely think it was difficult. You know, it was hard running a company, you know, that I had started – you know, years ago and spent my life basically like singularly focused on it. And then the people that I had built for first were saying like, I don't trust you mm. to, to, you know, to stick around. Uh, I don't believe in you. Um, but that's life. I mean, that's, that's what a company, you know, that yeah. most companies do not work out. And so I think it's a reasonable suspicion. Um, and I, you know, I'm grateful that Gumroad did work out. Um, but maybe it didn't. Maybe, you know, it could. Maybe if we made a different turn, creators would have been right. So right, yeah. exactly. So. How did that feel at the time? That must have been really stressful. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think one of the harder things about the layoffs was that I didn't know how much of of it to communicate, and I'd always done, I think, a pretty good job with employees, with customers, with investors of like keeping everybody in the loop on like what we were working on what we planned to do, how big the team was, um, you know, our roadmap, things like that. Right. And it felt great because I could walk into a room and sort of just say, look, this is what we're doing. And it was very easy and low stress. And with the layoffs, I sort of had to, maybe I didn't have to, but I decided to, or for my own ego, I, I felt like I needed to sort of detach a little bit from sort of the public, you know? Oh, okay. And say, you know, I, I don't necessarily want creators to know that we did a big round of layoffs. So if they didn't see the news, then we'll just pretend that it didn't happen. <laughs> or, um, you know, we're not going to communicate to people how few employees we have because they might not feel, you know, safe using our platform. Yeah. And so I think that was the most difficult thing is I would walk into a meeting with someone and I wouldn't really know. Like how much they knew about Gumroad or me or anything. Um, and so that was just sort of like this weird sort of adjustment that I had to make. Um, you know, it's just is sort of filtering, you know, my identity, mm. right? Like communicating, you know, when I was 
you know, traveling um, the, you know, the world trying to like find meaning. And I didn't want to tell people that I was not, you know, in San Francisco most of the time, you ah, know, because okay. that was part of my identity. It was just like San Francisco startup founder. Like why would, if you're starting, you know, if you're running a company in San Francisco, like you should probably be there most of the time. Right. So do, you, do, you, do you feel like you was um, like living to a lot of unwritten rules then at that time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think a lot of any sort of bubble or any uh, sort of insular group of people, right, where you have like a, a sort of homogenous majority um, like you do in startups, you end up with, yeah, a lot of sort of posturing and a lot of fitting in. And like presenting yourself in a way that's acceptable, right? Uh, and none of it is malicious, but it's just like the way it goes. If everyone's wearing a suit and you're not wearing a suit, it, you just don't want to be noticed, you know. And especially when things aren't going your way, you want to be noticed less. Mm. And so I think it's just sort of like this sort of primal reaction to kind of like camouflage, right? Uh, and I think everyone does that. I don't think it's sort of restricted to. Uh, to startups or anything like that. Um, but it does uh, create um, a little bit of a, yeah, just like a cognitive dissonance where you're living like a double life almost, right? Mm. So how did the company change after the, the layoffs and now everything's settled down a bit? Uh, well, now it's great. It was a little bit rough for a while because... You know, I'd started this company that I wanted to be huge and important and meaningful, yeah. and it didn't. I didn't know if it was going to do that, and so I was spending my time working on this thing that, you know, I didn't know was going to fulfill those things for me, and um, so it was tough. But I think it, what it did was it, one, we were profitable, right? So at least it was like paying my bills. And so the way that I thought about it was like I'm going to take the time that I now have that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. And focus on learning, on growing, uh, and having new experiences, meeting people, etc. Uh, and over time, I think as I traveled, I moved to Provo from San Francisco. I started to realize that I like it was possible to detach my identity from Gumroad and like be a person outside of it. Uh, and I think when I was able to do that, I was able to say, "Look, this is what Gumroad is. It's just a thing that I have." It's thing that I run right but I almost feel like it was gifted to me you know it was mm. like startup past saw it was like a startup founder um sort of failed and like gift died and like gifted this thing to me in his will <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and now I get to run this thing and it's awesome and I love doing it but the stakes of it seem lower because it's no longer my baby it's like yes. past saw thing I just I'm like lucky enough that he chose me instead of somebody else, you know, and it's weird. It's like a weird way to think about it. I think. Yeah. I like that way of thinking of it though. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It helps me sort of frame it in my head and, and, Mm. you know, sort of be able to focus on just making it a really great product for the people that use it instead of trying to, you know, make it this massive billion dollar company. Yes. um, That I think would be sort of go against a lot of, the values that sort of now exist. And I think the other thing that happened was because I was able to detach myself, I was able to sort of remove a lot of my value judgments from Gumroad too, Mm. right? And I was able to just say, look, this is, I'm just going to do what Gumroad needs um, instead of make Gumroad do what I want it to be and what what I want it to do. Right. And I think that also gave me um, sort of, or gave Gumroad really a lot of freedom to sort of decide, okay, this is, what Gumroad should be. And like now it's my job to serve that purpose um, and to sort of do the right thing for the users, for the company, for the creators. And so that's sort of where I'm, where, where I'm focused is like, okay, how do I do that? And I think everyone says that, right? Everyone says, oh yeah, of course, like we're going to do what's right for our users. That's what Facebook says. That's what Google says, et cetera. Yeah. But, you know, I think, I don't know. I think I believe it. <laughs> Absolutely. More, I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I think in general, like, when you, when you lose the pressure of growth, uh, when, when that bec- is no longer like the sort of single North Star that you have, you can focus on all of these other things that are um, sort of a little bit less 
because uh, growth is really about sort of maximizing your net worth, right? In a way, it's this sort of abstraction on you grow the company, which grows the valuation, which grows your percentage of the, you know, which grows your revenues, which grows your valuation, which grows your, you know, net worth on paper. Um, and obviously, I'm not saying that's, you know, that's an abstraction on how much value you've created, et cetera, right? So it's not just like, oh, people are just trying to get rich. Sure. Uh, but I think when that abstraction broke for me, when it was no longer the case, it was like, oh, cool. Like, what do I want? Okay, well, I'd rather focus on being open about the company or like doing cool things for charity with this thing that I have. Yeah. Or all of these other things that are much more sort of personally fulfilling. Um, they don't give me points on the scoreboard as much. Um, like, you know, raising $30 million, my in that insular community I was part of. Sure. But I'm already noticing that I feel like I just, I get credit. I just get credit in a different way. Mm. And I'm sort of, I've become comfortable with that. I think I was sort of told by society that like there was there are very few ways to get credit. You know, right, right, right. Um, and I think that's just not true. And I think a lot of people realize this as they get older and they have kids and stuff. But I just, I just learned it in a weird way mm. that most people don't. I think you know some people might listen to this and be like, duh, um, and that's reasonable. I think that's a reasonable reaction. For sure, for sure. I think that's a brilliant way of framing it. Because you're now doing what, like you said, what's best for, for Gumroad in itself, not what's best for your personal growth in that sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that will actually create more value. Yeah, I think, you know, I ran into this problem where I was Sawhill 100% of the time and I was working on Gumroad 100% of the time. And so there needed to be this like perfect overlap between what was the right thing for Gumroad and what was the right thing for me. Mm. And being able to say, look, I'm going to spend X amount of time on Gumroad. It's not me. It's separate from me. And in those, in that sort of circle, I am going to be just doing what's right for Gumroad, not what's right for me. And in the other circle, I'm going to do what's right for me and what's, you know, just what's right for me, not what's right for Gumroad. Yeah. That's my time. And sure, there's an overlap, right? It's a sort of a Venn diagram in which... I'm doing things that are both the right thing for me and the right thing for Gumroad. Hopefully that's still a lot of what I do, Mm -hmm. but I don't need to like force it to be a hundred percent of what I do. It can be 30% or 50% or 80% or 10% depending on the day or 0% maybe. Yeah. Uh, And it's, it's okay. You know, the the creators are still getting value from Gumroad regardless. Yeah. So that gives me sort of a little bit more flexibility, I think in, in doing that. For sure. So your your brain must be constantly ticking. How do you how do you switch <laughs> off? Like how is your workday structured? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I really try to block out my calendar. Like I'm a pretty uh, I'm a pretty uh, routine person. Mm-hmm. Like I love routine, um, and so I try to sort of schedule, you know, calls, meetings, podcast interviews, uh, writing meetups, and uh, the other thing is I do a lot of random crap. <laughs> so if I don't, if I don't do some sort of blocking and bucketing, I just will like the thing that I really love to do. That's easy. I'll just do all the time. And so I kind of need to force myself to break it up a little bit, break mm-hmm. up my time. But really it's just that it's just making sure that I'm really diligent about, you know, my schedule when I'm hanging out with my girlfriend, when I'm grabbing dinner with friends, uh, when I have my writing meetup and building it in a way, you know, that allows for, like me to be able to do all those things yeah. um, instead of say, okay, I'm just going to do what's like the right thing today. Cause for me, I think there are people that can do that. But for me, I would just pick, like, I'm just going to read all day. Like there's so many productive things I could be doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I procrastinate by just doing another productive thing. Yeah. Right? I do, I do the same. <laughs> so it's, it's hard when you do that to, to, to sort of, Make sure that you're doing the right thing long term, right? Uh, because you can always be productive. And so instead, I try to sort of say, okay, I need to write five hours a week. Where am I going to do that? Okay, now that's in my calendar. I do that every Friday in the morning from eight to twelve. Okay. Um, you know, I do all my. You know, I want to block out my Monday mornings because you know that's like my overflow from the weekend and on like all you know, all whatever needs to happen for the week. I try to do all the urgent stuff I want to do Monday morning, mm-hmm. and so it's. When you start blocking it out, you start like you, it's kind of a paradox of choice. When everything's open, you're like, "When am I going to go to the gym? I don't know. I'll never go." Yes. But when you have like all this stuff scheduled, you're like, "Okay, perfect. There's like a three-hour block right there." 
you know? That's a very good point. And so you can just, uh, yeah, there's a great book on it called Thinking Fast and Slow, and he talks a lot about this idea that the more specific you are, like, the easier it is to, like, surface um, – surface stuff. So if I say, you know, name an engineer, you might be like, I don't know. But if I say name a, you know, a, a, a black woman engineer, you'd be like, oh, that one, you know, right. it's sort of like, like your brain is able to visualize the answer much quicker. And so I think it's similar. It's like you want to structure your time in a way that gives you these slots where you can be like, cool, I can just plug stuff in instead of this like crazy blank canvas. When you think about creators, mm. right, you think about, you know, writer's block with a blank page or yeah. like the blank and that being really scary and the right way to fix it is to stop having a blank canvas like load it up with stuff that you know you're gonna new, do or need to do or need to write or whatever like you know if you have a great song like put that first lyric that you know is gonna be in the song down mm. you can always move it around yeah that's and, a really know, good tip so same thing with uh with like my schedule i try to i have a list of all the things i want to do every week and i just make sure to get those things in there that is a really really good tip i love that so, do you think that because you're both um, a creative, uh, you're a writer, a, a painter as well, um, but also a, a business person, do you reckon that in itself is um, that process in that the business takes up a lot of your slots and then the creative has to fit in? I actually do it the other way around. I like that. So I block in all my creative time. Uh which I try to keep at a max of probably like 20 hours a week. I mean, right now it's less, but it used to be around 20 hours a week. Um, and sometimes I even like schedule like classes. I'm like, okay, this open studio is happening every Saturday or every Wednesday from 6.30 to 9.30 or whatever at night. And so mm. I'll, I'll block in those times that are sort of externally, you know, chosen by some other person. And then I just work around them. I'm like, cool, I'll go do that. I um, like that. So, and then the thing with Gumroad, it's funny because I always tell people Gumroad is like my last priority. And some people are like, that's your company though. Like, how can you treat that as your like last priority? And I'm like, well, I know I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's very easy for me to work on. If I like, I will accidentally work on Gumroad for eight hours. Right. Yeah. You know? And so I need to make sure that I'm going to the gym and painting and writing. And if I do those things, I will be better at working on Gumroad because I'm not going to just be oh yeah I can work on Gumroad for 50 hours this week like what do I do it will force me to be mindful about how I'm using my time and make sure that when I'm working on Gumroad I'm doing sort of like the right thing for mm -hmm. customers and creators not just the easy thing just to work on it because yes. I'm bored <laughs> that is such a brilliant tip and I think that a lot of creators that hear this um, should follow suit you know, start scheduling it in and then you'll be, you kind of get what you've got, which is kind of a, a bird's eye view of your main uh, that responsibility. But because of that, you're, you're able to, to do what's best, not, yeah, not whatever comes up, which is totally. Which is and awesome. I, I think you can, you, you know, there's a difference in priority in terms of what's on your calendar and then priority in terms of what you want to do. Mm. And you just have to be mindful of, you know, there are certain activities in your day that are very high willpower. Like they require a lot of, of willpower um, for different people that might be different things. Um, and, and you just have to know, OK, these these are the things that are really hard for me to do, but they're really important. Um, and you should probably schedule those, you know, at times in which you're not going to get distracted. No one's awake to annoy you. Um, it hasn't been long enough in the day for things to come up. You know, that's how I think about it, right? Yeah. What, what, like, for me, I, I want to write every week. And writing is super hard for me to do. It's a struggle. And so mm -hmm. I have to schedule that super early in the morning. So I wake up and I just go to the coffee shop and I sit down and I, you know, I start writing. Um, I can't do that 9 p.m. at night at my house no. um, whenever I feel like it. But I can work on Gumroad you know, at three in the morning, wherever. I see. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, because it's just, I've done it for almost, you know, eight years, you know, it's, it's easy enough for me to, to slip into that. Mm. If that makes sense. Second and nature. So, yeah. It's like, it's super, so you just need to, you know, and writing, hopefully one day I can say the same about writing and painting. Um, but 
for now I can't. And so I just have to sort of be okay with that. And, mm. you know, I used to think it was like a failure. Like if I couldn't just spin up and spin down, um, when I was writing or painting, yeah. um, but then as I've talked to more and more creators, I've realized that like everyone, even the most amazing thing, people that you just think live and breathe music, they have to work hard at yeah. these things, or yeah. at least at components of those things that are necessary and part of sort of the essential whole. And if you don't, um, you know, same thing, you have to recognize that those people, like Usain Bolt, I'm sure he has days where he just, just doesn't want to train, yeah. you know? And he just has to figure that out. Has to. Either I like my job because I can be lazy and sit on my laptop in bed and uh, be productive. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great a great thing. Um, but then it also means like I don't go to the gym unless I schedule it. So mm. I have to make sure that that happens too. Definitely. Definitely. I think, yeah, I think for most creatives um, – there is work around the creativity that no one really wants to do, but you have to do. Even if you look at the most successful um, musicians and artists in the world, um, maybe 20% of what they're doing is the actual art. Then there's a lot of, you know, meet and greets, um, brand uh, collaborations, like things like that, that aren't necessarily anything to do with the music, but that's the work, you know? So what, in, in whatever we're doing, there's going to be things that we have to do. Um, so I think, yeah, I think your structure is a really good hack or, or tip of, of how to structure it in, in your mind. You know, I really love that. It's, it sounds quite peaceful as well, where you've got... Um, yeah, I think when, when you have a routine and a schedule like that, what it means is you're not... You can sort of say if a, if a thought pops up around something that's not part of what you're supposed to be working on, you can just either write it down or forget about it or just say, I'll rethink about you in four hours. Right. Whereas I think when you're not doing that, it, it becomes very easy to just say yes to everything and to start th just getting overwhelmed with all the things that you have to do. And when you're a creator, there's a lot of that. There's emails, there's like blogging, there's tweeting, there's social media, there's checking your stats, your analytics, there's advertising, there's making music, there's, I'm sure a million parts, different components of making music that I'm not even familiar with. Yeah. There's talking to your label, your manager, your agent, doing live performances, your merchandise, design, website. And so if you don't block it out, you're just going to be overwhelmed. Mm. You know. Um, whereas for me, I just say, look, every like three hours every quarter, I'm going to work on my website and updating it a little bit. Then I just say, okay, look, I'm just going to have a note on my, you know, on my computer and every time I have an idea for my website, I'll just put in that note. And then like once every three three months, I'll like open that note and see what's in there. Mm, that's a good idea. And then you don't have to think about that stuff for the rest of the time. Mm, very good ideas. Very good ideas. So, I mean, we spoke about Gumroad a lot. Um, let's talk about the actual creators that use um, Gumroad. Can you... Let us know some of your favorite stories um, that have come off Gumroad, like creator stories. Yeah, of, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, one of my favorite stories is um, a illustrator based out of North Carolina. This guy's name's Kyle Kyle Webster, and he started selling Photoshop brushes, brushes so you could paint digitally on Photoshop. These are really nice, like very specific, very uh, sort of tried to be very realistic and tactile in mm -hmm. terms of like how they mix paint and oils and colors and things and the texturing, etc. And uh, he did super well. Like every illustrator and painter I'd ever talked to knew who he was. And then he ended up selling his business to, to Adobe. And now his brushes are sort of built directly into Photoshop. Oh, wow. So I don't know how many millions of people are using his brushes, but you know, it was just like a fun thing that he tried, you know, on Gumroad a while ago and, it's just kind of cool. I like that example uh, because it just shows like just the amount of impact you can have um, by starting small and just by starting, you know, with a toy basically. And then years go by and, you know, now his brushes are built right into Photoshop and millions of people are probably using them every single day. That's incredible. And, uh, 
Yeah, I, I love that story. Um, I think that's a really great one. Yeah. Um, the, I, you know, honestly, a lot of the a lot of the stories have nothing to do with you know making a bunch of money. I mm. certainly have those. I had a friend with an Instagram account with a you know a bunch of memes and had a pretty sizable fan base. And uh, I told her about Gumroad, and you know she started selling on Gumroad, and she ended up making like fifty grand, fifty thousand dollars in the first month. Whoa. So there's yeah it's pretty nuts uh one of my favorite artists wolfpeck uses gumroad and nice. i just love their music so yeah. that <laughs> is always cool um yeah i think but to me honestly a lot of it is just there's stories that i'm probably not even familiar with but they're mm. just people that are making 50 bucks 100 bucks 200 bucks 300 bucks yeah yeah and that's just making their life easier and gonna show them that this stuff is possible and that's the stuff that I love um, hearing about is is not necessarily the you know the massive acquisition by mm. Photoshop or, or by Adobe or whatever, but the path like what got them on that path in the first place. And typically, it's like oh, I tried something and I made a fifty bucks, but I realized it was possible. I realized people were interested in this or what have you. Right. Yeah, that makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's real impactful what you're doing or what yeah, what the company's done for for creatives for sure yeah it's it's super cool and it's you know something that i don't think i'll ever get bored of hearing about you know yeah um it's always amazing when someone yeah tells me oh yeah i paid for my you know my kids college fund or like this you know it's funny like sometimes i'll just be hanging out with people and then you know someone will ask them like what you know what what have you bought with your gumroad earnings or whatever like what mm-hmm. do you do with it and then one time someone was like oh yeah like i my house actually it's wow a gumroad and i was just like <laughs> why did you not tell me that <laughs> <laughs> like that is amazing that's insane wow that must make you feel just wow incredible so yeah it's super you know and at the end of the day i mean it's not just gumroad right like there's you know the internet needed to exist and Instagram needed to exist and Facebook needed to exist and, you know, credit card processing companies needed to exist. And there's a whole world of stuff that needs to happen. Yeah. True. Uh, for these people that, for the, for this, for these people to be able to lead these lives and have these results. And Gumroad is certainly a, a part of that, a, a significant, hopefully part of that. But yeah, I think it's just mostly it's just acknowledging yeah, it's a, you know, every everyone that does something significant is it's probably not a, a solo effort. Mm. You know, and I think uh, being open and honest about that and saying, yeah, look, I think Gummer did some amazing things, but I'm not going to take full credit for it. Yeah. Um, um yeah, I think that's I think that's sort of the right approach and I think if everyone did that, if everyone was just trying to participate instead of become the thing or like the winner, uh we'd probably just be better off, I think, as a society in general. It sounds like it. It sounds like taking the, the right approach is what Gumroad's about. Um, even the the guy that does the, the Photoshop paintbrushes, he started out as with with the right approach. He, I, I doubt he uh, his intention was to get Adobe's attention. Um, <laughs> you know, it was to, to see if this thing would work and if it would, if other people would find value in it. And I think that's the right approach. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Brilliant, brilliant. So, I mean, we have all kinds of creators that listen to this podcast. Um, can you, like, if you just, yeah, explain uh, what kind of creators would work well for, for Gumroad? Is it all sorts or? Yeah, it's a pretty broad spectrum. And every time I think I know everything on Gumroad, like I find some other stuff that right. I'm I'm like, okay, cool. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> uh, I didn't even know people would be into that, but that's great. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think you know, if you if you make stuff, like if you consider yourself a creator, if you spend a significant amount of your free time, and you wish you could spend more of your time making really anything, if it's a video, a you know, a musical, a stand up special anything that basically is a file on your computer in some capacity um and you think 
you have an audience that would be interested in supporting you, um, I think Gumroad could be a great fit. You know, um, I think it's worth trying at least. I think the, one of the cool features that we have is you can do pay what you want pricing. So you could say it's zero plus. People can donate, mm-hmm. um, or they can get it for free, and it's you know free for us. Like we don't, or free for you. We don't charge you anything. So uh, you know if if that's like I, to me, I consider that the sort of the gateway drug of Gumroad. Right. <laughs> um, if you're interested but you're not convinced, you can create an account and it takes like a minute and you could say, okay, I'm going to sell this song for zero plus. And you can even listen to the song for free on SoundCloud or Spotify. But if you want to support me, you can get the lossless version, right? right. Um, or, or what have you. Um, but you know, it's funny. It's like ever since Gumroad was profitable, I don't really sell Gumroad anymore. And you know, I just sort of educate people on it. I'm like, mm. look, this is the thing. If you're, if you're interested, like, let me know. You can send me an email, uh, and I'm happy to tell you more about it. Uh, or you can just sign up. Um, but if you don't use it, that's okay as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, it's not the end of the world. So yeah. Brilliant. 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 Yes. Yeah, so definitely. Everybody's at least sign up and see if it works for you in your particular, uh, creative world. Definitely. Um, so this has been uh, an amazing conversation. Just want to ask, uh, couple more questions if that's cool um sure if you could go back to speak to sahil at age 16 what what advice would you give yeah i mean honestly things worked out so i feel (laughs) like i'm a little i would be worried about altering the space-time continuum (laughs) and like who knows like what you know um what would have happened since uh, if I changed some small thing? Yeah, exactly. But you know, I think just in general, I I think I wish I wish that past Sahil had like a little bit more patience and like knew that it was. I felt like I was in such a hurry uh, to get to some place important, right? And you know, I think I did. Uh, so I don't necessarily regret it, but I think I was always like, you know, I was like at at school and then I left school and then I was at Pinterest and then I left Pinterest and then I was at Gumroad and then we raised a bunch of money and I, I just like wanted every single year to be like a bigger bigger thing that when it stopped happening for me I just like didn't really know how to deal with it mm. um, and I don't think that was probably very good for, for my just like my emotional health Yeah. and so I think you know just being comfortable taking more time thinking things through doing more research like not trying to be a 25 year old billionaire or whatever the goal was in my head. Yeah. Um, you know, I think people have their whole lives ahead of them to do cool stuff, to do interesting things. And your priorities are going to shift. And I think structuring your life, um, in such a singular way, um, like I need to be this company. I need to run this company. I'm going to do it until I die. It's just not super sustainable. Mm. So, Mm. that's kind of what I would tell Sahil was just look like take your time work on stuff make sure that you're thinking about the long term make sure that you're focused on learning um, and being nice and like not trying to you know one up yourself every day you know there's this saying in, that I really don't like actually um, that is like if you make yourself 1% better every day you know have you ever heard that like if you make yourself yeah. 1% better every day you're, in a year, you're going to be 40 times better than you are today, which to me is absurd. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, how is that even possible? Like, what is 40 times better? Yeah, how do you quantify that? <laughs> like, what does that even mean? And it just makes, I don't know, to me, it's, I mean, I think there's some value in it and that sort of thinking of like, yeah, every day you should be learning and growing and eating healthy or whatever. But I think it also just gives you this like stress of like, you can't take a break. You're always on. You never know what you're missing. There's this like, just basically this like cultural FOMO, Mm -hmm. I think, which I think in general, like is not great. I think it just leads to people being too stressed. And for, even if it has no impact, you might as well minimize your stress levels. I think that's probably just good for your body and for your mind and for your, sort of long-term health you know i agree i agree i tweeted the other day that um 
you know, everyone's always working on becoming the best version of themselves. But what if the best version of yourself was two versions back? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because, like you said, sometimes we're just adding adding more to ourselves and trying to get further or, or higher or whatever. Yeah. But that might be for the wrong reason. And where you were potentially was a place of peace, which is ultimately where, where we want to be, I think. so. Totally. Yeah, man, definitely. Well, yeah, this has been an amazing conversation. Where, um, where can people check you out online and, and some of your creative stuff as well? Yeah, so um, my sort of default social media account is my Twitter. Um, so you can follow me at SHL. Uh, and then I also have a painting Instagram is probably the best place for that. And my Instagram handle is at SHL Paints. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and those those pieces of work are really good, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's coming along. It's been it's been a journey for sure. But yeah. it's uh it gives me grounding. Every day I you know, if I get to paint, it just shows me that I can be patient and that I don't need technology and software and high financial ROI to be you know, to feel good about myself. I can get better at painting in a very slow, methodical way, and that's that's okay, too. Wow, yeah, a lot of lessons in just painting as well. Yeah, that's really good. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, learned so much, especially uh, the tips and tricks on um, structuring your, your week and your day. That that was really, really cool, I think. I think a lot of people will take from that. Um yeah, and for, for people that want to sign up to Gumroad? Yeah, just go to gumroad.com. Uh, you can sign up pretty pretty quickly. Um, and there, if you have any feedback or questions for me, you can always just send me an email at sahil at gumroad.com, and I'm happy to answer them. Sweet, sweet, perfect. Um, thanks, guys, for listening to another episode of for the creators podcast um we've had a brilliant conversation with sahil today um if you can please give us a review on apple podcasts or itunes or wherever you hear this and send to a creator who you think will enjoy this conversation um we'll be back next week with another episode so we'll speak to you soon bye